Nothing from me. Nothing from me. Do you have any? Okay, now I'll stop yelling. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. All right, here's the consent. Does anyone have any comments before we make a motion? Oh. To push the button. That's at the base of the. Is that better? A little bit, but speak closer. Okay. Better? Okay. Um, thank you. It's good to see you all again. <laughs> and um, thank you for holding in person meetings again. Um, my name is Becky Steinbrenner. Regarding the consent agenda, I just want to speak to the minutes of May 2nd. Um, the presentation that was part of that by um, Montgomery and Associates, uh, Cameron and Tana. Um, I looked through that presentation material and thank you for making it available on the website. I was not able to attend that meeting. But on the maps, um, I never saw the um, monitoring well that was described a lot in Mr. Tana's report as SC5A. On the maps, there was an SC5, but it wasn't labeled as A. Uh, it had R or I think RC or something or RB, something like that. So I request that you review the presentation materials and make sure that the information on the maps concurs with that in the presentations. Thank you. And I'll move approval of the consent agenda. I'll second it. Okay. Too slow. Sure I do. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Nay? Anyone? Uh, unanimous. All right. Uh, oral communications. Uh, Members of the public are invited to speak at this time on any item that is not on the agenda. On. Hello, is it on? The little green light should be on. It's on. Yeah. I, can you, yeah, it doesn't. I don't really I don't, hear. Can you guys hear anything? Testing, testing. How about now? Oh, is that better? Hello? 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 Testing? Loud, so it's hard to tell. <laughs> now, yeah, now, now it's on. That, that seems better now, yes. Hello? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes, that's better. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrenner, and uh, I, I want to just... Um, express my disappointment that there was there were no water transfers that occurred this winter. We certainly had the abundant rain, and um, all of the conditions were met for the transfers to occur with the city of Santa Cruz, but it didn't happen. And I think that was a real lost opportunity to help recharge the um, the Mid County groundwater basin. So to that end, in today's San Jose Mercury News, I don't know if you, any of you get that paper, but front page, top of the fold, is an article, Groundwater is Back to Pre-Drought Levels. And inside the article, it talks about how in Santa Clara County, some of these uh, groundwater monitoring wells um, are at the highest levels they've ever been since 1936. Uh, yeah, when they started measuring in 1936, these are the highest levels they've ever seen. And it also mentions in the article that the coastal 
groundwater levels have also increased. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing the uh, results of the monitoring wells, the, the good information your district puts out, as, all, as well as comparing that with the AEM uh, resistivity studies that were done last fall by the state-funded project to fly the helicopter over and get a snapshot again and compare that with what the Mid-County Groundwater Agency's uh, RAMPL studies did in, I think it was 2017. Um, I also want to thank you for posting the videos of your former meetings. I was very ill in February and was not able to attend or, um, any of the meetings that, at that time. And I was very curious to see why your district stopped charging water demand offset fees. And I understand that better now. I'm, I'm puzzled by it still, but um, I'm glad you're not charging those fees anymore. I'm worried about the groundwater though still, and that you have no conservation projects that would have qualified you to be able to continue collecting that money. Finally, I want to submit some documents here that I really think should be made public, and this is the only way to make them public. Um, to, and I ask that they be scanned and included in your correspondence. They are correspondence from um, regarding the Pure Water SoCal, and it includes the uh, conditional permits for the project. So I will hand these to um, your, your uh, clerk and ask that they be scanned and included for the public record and be included as correspondence. Thank you. I just want to comment on the water transfers a little bit. Uh, we're not privy to the thinking, you know, the thinking and the situations that the city of Santa Cruz experiences, but there it's, it may sound counterintuitive, but sometimes when the water, it's really stormy, the water is just too, it's not usable. It, it just has to be let, it's flood water, it has to go down into the ocean. It's just not suitable for capturing for fresh water. Direct. Water use, uh, surface water. So it's just one of those situations that it can, you can have too much and too little water sometimes. But like, as I said, we're not privy to the city of Santa Cruz's uh, thinking about how they can distribute their water. Well, the other thing, of course, is that I think every time that there's been a halt of transfer, it's been because of conditions in the city. I don't think we've ever halted them because of conditions on our side of the line. So I think this is, again, one of those instances where the variance is low and we just sit around and be ready. Yes, and President Christensen, if I may add, actually Rosemary Menard, the water director for the city of Santa Cruz, called me today, as we often talk, and she mentioned that um, how it's, she can understand it's easy for people who don't have the knowledge base to think that it rains heavy that there should be transfers and not understand your conditions of turbidity and that sort of thing. So it reinforces what you said. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, I'd just like to comment on the groundwater levels of the coast. Boy, do I wish they were the highest since 1936. But the, the, our, the, yeah, no. Don't move across the hill. Yeah. <laughs> and even though it said something about coastal, I don't know where they were talking about. It wasn't here. Our, our water levels are still uh, too low to keep seawater from intruding. And wish it, wish it wasn't the case, but it is the case. Administrative uh, reports, none. Administrative business, conservative, conditional and unconditional will serves. There are none at the moment. Uh, I guess the big item, the budget adoption. And if you'll recall, we had a 
workshop where we hashed out a lot of the decisions that were made that went into this budget plan and it looked pretty good except for one glaring error <laughs> and that was the 300 days of sunshine in Santa Cruz County. Not this year, huh? Okay. As long as you put a little asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't And I only, I only have just a couple of slides. Um, so we're here this evening um, bringing our draft budget back to the board for consideration for adoption. And I just put together just a couple of brief slides just to kind of give you an idea um, of any changes that were made um, since our last meeting. So the changes that we've made to the budget since our May 2nd budget workshop we did add $50,000 to our um, uh, capital projects budget to replace the um, North Street main that was damaged during the uh, Bates Creek culvert flooding that we experienced during the winter storms. We've also revised the amount that we've allocated for the utility relocation um, for the county buffered bike lane project. We increased that from $150,000 to $300,000. So those are the two changes that we've made since our May 2nd meeting. And then just some notable items in the budget. I did want to kind of share this with the board. Um, we have our budgeted water use five-year comparison, and you can see how drastically our water use has dropped over the last five years. And then you can see our budgeted water sales uh, comparison where we're looking at the revenue that we're getting from our water sales. And you can see that it has remained fairly flat. And what this means for us is the rate study that we did in 2018 had forecasted some revenue for the district that we didn't necessarily collect. And the reason we didn't see that revenue come in is mainly because of the decreased water sales. So it's kind of small print there, but I did give a, re a cumulative revenue shortage for the last five years. We're about $8.1 million short on where the finance plan had projected those rates would take us. So I just wanted to make sure that we were aware of that, especially as we move into um, a new rate study. Good news is we saved more water. You did save more water, yes. <laughs> Go broke if we don't change something. And so this I wanted to share as well. The graph that I'm showing you here is from the U.S. Um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it's just an inflation graph that shows what inflation's been like since about 2003. And so on the far right side of the graph, you can see the recent inflation that we've experienced the inflation average for last year was about 8%. The inflation for April of this year, April 2023, was 5%. And the projected inflation for this last month, May, is going to be about 5.4%. So I just wanted to share that information in comparison to where the district stands on their operating um, expenditures. We had an increase in base operating expenses of about 6.29%. If you take a look at that, excluding personnel costs, if you're just looking at our supplies and services for the district, then it's about 2%. And then if we take a look at the base operating expenses and we exclude that overlap position that we added to our personnel budget this year, we're at about 5.24%. So we have made a very concerted effort this year to try and mitigate our operating expenditures and you can see that given the inflation that we've experienced over the last couple of years that we are tracking below that except for our personnel costs of course 
And then I just wanted to give you guys um, a little kudos. I appreciate the board's support in um, budgeting for pre-funding our pension and our OPEB obligations. I've shared the charts that show what has happened over the last five to seven years as we've made a concerted effort to fund those programs. By pre-funding those pension benefits, we reduce that annual lump sum contribution, so it saves the district money on an annual basis, and it reduces our unfunded liability on our financial statements. It improves the financial forecasts, and it really says to the rating agencies that we're serious about how we're managing those long-term liabilities. Uh, Pre-funding those other post-employment benefits um, also reduces that unfunded liability on our financial statements. And it also reduces the chance for some unexpected expenditures, kind of smooths that expenditure stream a little bit so that we don't see huge spikes in expenditures from year to year. So as you can see here, we are about 80%, I think it's 83% funded now on our OPEB. And on our pension funding, our tier one plan is at about 84%. Our tier two plan and our PEPRA plan are actually overfunded. Um, we'll never hit it exactly 100% because from year to year, there's changes in those OPEB obligations. That liability changes from year to year, plus the investment performance changes from year to year. So that kind of offsets our contributions a little bit. So it'll kind of go up and down over the years. But we've made a real concerted effort to make, to make those payments and to improve that liability standing. So I think it saved the district quite a bit of money, actually. Well, I guess we all should pat ourselves on the back then. You definitely should. Great job. It's made a big difference, didn't it? it? It has. It's made a tremendous difference. And so that was it. I just wanted to share that information with you. And so that kind of takes us back now to our agenda. Any questions before we open it up to comment? So in the memo, there was a, um, on about the third paragraph, it said, um, in addition, performance metrics will be added for each department. And I just had a question about what performance metrics were. So we've been collecting data over the last few years because performance metrics are kind of a, a requirement now for the Government Finance Officers Association's budget award. And so the types of metrics we've been accumulating on a departmental level, um, Shelley shared a lot of information on the number of turf rebates and how much water savings we've achieved year after year, um, uh, toilet rebates and how much water that saved us how many water-wise house calls we do. From the finance department standpoint, I share that funding of the OPEB and pension uh, graphs that I just showed you, that kind of performance trend, as well as um, the number of shutoffs that we do, the number of customers um, that are in delinquent status, how many days of cash we have on hand, just kind of normal you know, performance metrics for finance. So we just kind of track those, uh, how many main breaks we have, how many valves we've exercised, and how many dead ends we've flushed, just performance metrics like that. And comparing year to year, yeah. We try to look at those um, in relation to other benchmarks and from agencies and then see trends in ours, so. And constantly modifying. I sent you some stuff this week about maybe ones to add too. So it's it, it's a it's in flux. Do you have any like customer um, customer calls things like that? Performance metrics, right? In terms of um, how many customers are um, shut off, or or like you know how many like would would how many are signed up for WaterSmart be a performance? Right, that would be a good trend as well. Is how many sign up for WaterSmart? Complaints, that sort of thing. We do wa like water we de quality Decreasing complaints? the number of complaints or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Water quality complaints is another thing that we track. I have a question. Um, given all the financial situation of the district and what we've done and what we're doing and the economy in general uh, and what we're talking about tonight, um, and going into the rate study, do we have now a, a goal for what we think the rate, the total rate needs to be? Of course, that gets 
Right. I, I don't know. Some of the things that are going to contribute to that mm -hmm. are our water consumption. You can see by the charts that I shared this evening that um, with the water consumption we're currently seeing, we're going to have to probably raise rates just to stay in tune with mm -hmm. that decreased water consumption. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we've got the inflation that we need to worry about, um, as well as uh, um, making up that $8 million shortfall. That's going to make it a little tough then to come up with rates that people will understand. Uh, right. Well, we, we are probably are facing a rather challenging rate study this time around. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, can can you clarify? Did you say that um, the district will be eight point one million dollars short this year? Did I hear that right? Please make your comments and we'll. And okay. Well, my comment is, I hope uh, we'll that I didn't hear that right. <laughs> eight point one million short. That's. The same number the county board of supervisors is looking at. So, all of these deficits with uh, a lot of inflation really make me worried. And I would like to request that um, part of your performance data also include the number of customers who ask to be put on a payment plan, or or those who default and cannot pay their bills, and have to um, have to have some sort of assistance. I think that's a very good metric, especially if you're as you're going to a new rate study. Thank you. Right. Uh, Leslie, <clears throat> as I heard it, that was anticipated funds, the eight point one million that we did not realize because of lower water use. Correct. That's over the last five years of that yeah. rate study. It's okay. the cumulative impact of eight point one million that we didn't collect. That the finance plan uh, that we did for the rate study that anticipated we would collect. Just so we're not short on our budget. Right. We just didn't meet a prediction. We just didn't meet our finance plan targets. Yeah. Which means we didn't spend that money because we never run a deficit. We're not allowed to. So. Yeah, and like, like the federal government, we have a balanced budget. <laughs> or unlike the federal government, more likely. <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted to make a comment on the, again, on the quality of the document. Um, it's, again, not just a budget. It's like a whole summary of what we do. And, and so it's, if, if somebody just wanted to find out what we're up to, they could just read this. You know, and get a pretty good feel for what, what we've been working on and what's important. So, so great job on that. Yeah, if I may add a few words, as always, on the budget. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a, an extension of our strategic plan. Um, going back to the pre-funding, uh, some of the uh, outstanding liabilities, you know, when we, went, when we had the, credit, the uh, rating agencies, credit rating agencies, uh, talked to us back a couple of years ago. That was one of the things you could tell that they were really impressed by that, you know, first of all, kudos to Leslie for, for nudging us that way, right, and for the board being receptive because it's, it's easy not to, to look toward the future and make those uh, payments now, and the board has done that, and it's obviously put us in a good position, but I can tell you firsthand, um, remember when we talked to those three different um, rating agencies they when we mentioned that and they saw that that was an impressive factor so i just want to say kudos and thank you for that leslie it definitely shows discipline to me because we didn't get that 8.9 million that we were looking for one way to make up the shortfall would be to not prefund these things and yet we continued to do that because it has this double benefit for us you know and uh, so we we did it Several several special districts and municipalities didn't do that. 
you know, periodically something crashes. Mini disaster caused by everything goes out. So it was really a chance. <laughs> and and it was a great budget report. That's a very great reporting. So good work. Um, this is. Are we just asking for input now, and it'll final come back, or can we vote? Can we adopt? I was going to make the motion. If you're to ready, adopt. you can adopt. Okay, I'll make that motion. I'll second. This is not a roll call. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any opposed? Uh, vote is unanimous. Good job. It helps to have had a workshop ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty informative. That's good. That's when you can ask all the embarrassing questions before you get to the actual. <laughs> so, uh, item seven point three: district staffing and reorganization. So I'm pulling a little that. double duty tonight. Okay. Oh, yeah. Good evening. Make sure you take notes on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and pay yourself double for that. <laughs> Good evening, President Christensen and board. Um, I'm Tracy, Human Resources Manager, and I'm presenting item 7.3 tonight and uh, asking the board to consider some changes within our staffing and organization as it relates to the finance business services, um, specifically customer service billing unit. Um, as the memo reads, uh, we're proposing a job family revision within the district's current staffing plan um, uh, relative to the customer service billing unit. And I'm, uh, I've, we're proposing some revisions and title changes. Um, we have some outdated job descriptions that really needed to take a look at uh, in customer service representative one, two and customer service supervisor position. And uh, we are also proposing a new staff level classification within the job family. Um, we uh, are proposing a new contracts and customer billing specialist position to address some needs that we've been identifying um, at the management level for a number of years in um, organizing and uh, really um, um, centralizing the district's uh, uh, service agreements and contracts and uh, an appropriate place for this position to sit, which currently these tasks are handled at the departmental level, um, is uh, with uh, many of the changes going on. And as we know, oftentimes regulatory needs become a little more complicated um, there's some GASB changes, the uh, governmental accounting um, standards uh, changes um, in regards to how we're handling certain uh, components of our service agreements and contracts. And so this position is really uh, created in, with that in mind to create a centralized location and staff support for the departments rather than departments kind of doing things individually. Um, we've worked really closely with Josh um, in kind of clearing uh, some of our processes up and cleaning some of our processes up and um, we feel that now it just makes sense to, to centralize some of those duties. Um, we're proposing no change in the level of uh, numbers of staff to handle these duties, but what we are proposing is we have a current um, position that's vacant um, due to a recent retirement. That's always um, part of our best business practices is to take a look at vacant positions and see how we move forward in staffing and it just made perfect sense for us to take that position and actually uh, do make some changes as we move forward, especially with Pure Water Soquel coming on board and um, create a, a, a level of position that, that really will handle those um, some of those roles and responsibilities and tasks that we're doing. Um, Included in the presentation tonight uh, is the proposed allocation um, to the, a, a specialist level. This position is being proposed as the contract and customer billing specialist. They will be continuing to serve the, the customer base. Um, and so um, we're not taking service away from our customers uh, on the customer service side, um, but we're enhancing some of the duties and responsibilities that um, a, a, an individual within that unit will be able to perform. Um, and some needed tasks. We're also proposing some changes and updates to the customer service representative one, two position. 
Um, that job description has not been um, modified since 2011, and definitely there's some changes as you can see with a lot of the the red strike. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we worked closely with staff, uh, uh, Leslie, um, the Valerie, the supervisor, and staff to to take a look at some of those changes and. Um, there was a lot of agreement that we were ready to, you know, implement uh, those changes. They were they're a little overdue and being relevant and um, uh, accurate to the tasks that are being performed by our staff right now. Uh, we also are looking to, um, uh, and it, we are proposing to make a, a, a salary adjustment to the customer service uh, position as uh, identified in the board memo. Um, we've got. A little bit of concerns in terms of that level of uh, uh, salary for the position and so um, because of some of the differences that we're concerned about in, in looking at some parity and it's and you know we definitely need to take a look at um, you know some equity issues and so we're proposing an adjustment to the customer service representative one two to align with the uh, customer service field representative one two uh, makes a lot of sense for us to do that at this time um, and then finally, uh, upgrade, uh, updating and a job title change to the customer service supervisor to um, really emphasize not only the customer service, but the billing uh, responsibilities uh, and role for that position. So with that, uh, there's some motions before the board. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Given these various changes, how much hiring are we going to do to make this, and how much can we fill in with existing personnel? Um, we have a vacant position right now, right. and so upon approval, the 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 uh, we'll post that position for recruitment. Uh, it's just one vacancy. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah and I, I might just add that that vacancy was just recently due to a retirement, like in the last month mm -hmm. or two. So yeah. it's recently. Well, that's good because it's a tough environment to hire in. Yeah, we've been we've been knee deep in recruitment, so. Yes. But we've had great candidates, I have to say. Any other questions? I'm happy to. No, it makes sense. Tracy, I have a quick clarification on the revised um, salary allocations. Are those revised supposed to be for the customer service um, billing technician rather than field technician? on the motion number two? Yes. Customer service billing, not field. <clears throat> well, are you referring to the the two bullets, the two bullets on number two, the, the two bottom bullets on number two, that job title is incorrect. It's supposed to read customer service billing, not customer service field. Oh, there. Thank you for that catch, Leslie. We didn't catch that before. It went into the packet. Yeah, we have customer service field and we have customer service office, so. Oh, okay. So we're going to change the motion. The motion is different. Public comment. Right. right. I'll make the motion with the um, correction of the it's customer service billing technicians one and two. I'll second. I'll make the motion. Both motions. Both motions. Okay. I second both. Okay. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? This passes unanimously. Okay, at this point we are adjourning to closed session. So anyone who wishes to comment on the closed session in its entirety? Thank you. Um, my name is Becky Steinbrenner, and I really haven't wanted to take all the legal action that I've been forced to take. And I had to do it because it was the only action available to me to challenge. 
the environmental determinations that your, your board has made. And you need to know that this, the Pure Water SoCal project has not received any collaboration with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's been really hard for me to get information, but um, recently a Public Records Act request with California Department of Fish and Wildlife did, did reveal that their agency did not submit comment on the draft EIR, which we knew it wasn't there. And they were not part of the collaboration, as is required by law, to develop meaningful and forcible mitigation monitoring reporting plan. So that's what I've been asking for a lot all along. And I just want to ask you again to make sure that this happens. Um, the pipeline is over the San Lorenzo River on the Laurel Strait Bridge. The attorney from California Department of Fish and Wildlife let me know they were not even aware of that. The materials I got were only for the Porter Street Bridge. And there, there was a lot of material on that piece. Nothing on the San Lorenzo River, nothing on the Laurel Street Bridge. So I'm really worried. And I just ask you to pay attention to these things. I'm not trying to cause trouble <laughs> unnecessarily. It's because I care, as do you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is it. Push your button. Good night.